Good morning, my village family. And thank you so much, um, Sister Tashina, for that prayer. Thank you. It's a privilege another time to be able to share the word with you. And I thank God for this privilege. And the title of my message to you this morning is Positioned for Purpose. That is, I'm sorry, uh, Positioned for Purpose. And the text underpinning my message is from Acts 9, 1 to 19 that was read earlier. And I want to read the first two verses again. And it says, all this time, Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples out for the kill. He went to the chief priest and got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. In the NIV translation, it says at the beginning of verse one, one meanwhile, and I looked up several translations and the common English Bible says, meanwhile, the Christian standard Bible says, no, Saul. The ESV says, but Saul. The message says, all this time. And what this says to me is that while something else was happening, Saul was persecuting Christians. And chapter eight ended with the account of Philip and the Ethiopian Enoch um, reading Isaiah and he didn't understand it. And so Philip, Philip explained it to him and the Enoch asked to be baptized. So something was happening while Saul was on his way to persecute the Christians. The message and the thing that was happening was that the message of the gospel was being spread. Meanwhile, Saul was being wicked. Saul was on the way from Jerusalem to Damascus. And from my research, that's approximately 150 miles. He got warrants from the chief priests and his expressed purpose was to go and arrest believers in Damascus. And I want you to picture this morning a, a physical roadmap or in more modern times, perhaps Google Maps on which Saul would have charted his course. He had one purpose in mind, but God had another. God interrupted Saul's plan because he was ready to call Saul and to use him. Saul's position was about to change. Verse four says that he fell to the ground and that was the first shift in Saul's position. He fell to the ground. Then he was struck with blindness. That was another change in his position from a position of see, being able to see to a position of blindness. Then his companions took him off the ground. That was another position shift. And then they led him for three days while he was blind to Damascus. What I found interesting is that Saul's destination remained the same. Remember he set out to go to Damascus to persecute the Christians. But though his destination remained the same, his purpose changed. And you may be listening and wondering, well, what does that have to do with your journey? And what is this purpose that I speak of? Ultimately, our purpose as Christians is for the fulfillment of what Reverend Heron described last week as the royal mandate. It's the ultimate purpose of a Christian is to win souls for Christ, and it's not optional. That is why it's called a mandate. But the problem with many of us as Christians is that we have not accepted it as a mandate. For many of us, our lips say yes, but our actions and our attitudes say otherwise. Because guess what? If we accepted the mandate, and we have not accepted that where God has us is intentionally positioning us for the fulfillment of that purpose, then there's a problem. True acceptance of our purpose means that we should also be that unless we are outside of the will of God and be disobedient, our position is connected to our purpose. 
But the truth is, if we're to be honest, many times we believe and act like our position is a hindrance or an interruption to our purpose being fulfilled. Saul's original purpose was to persecute. His purpose was driven by Satan's agenda. But after his encounter with God, his purpose would change. Our purpose as believers have already changed because we've already had that encounter with God. But the thing that we struggle with is our position. So let's continue to look at Saul's conversion. Verse 10 um, onward reads, There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. The master spoke to him in a vision. Yes, master, he answered. Get up and go over to the straight avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's there praying. He has just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. And it continues. What are the key observations in this scripture? While Saul was in Damascus, blind and not eating or drinking for three days, God was speaking to Ananias in a vision. He instructed Ananias to go to Judas's house at a particular location and ask for Saul. And he told him what to do when he got there, lay his hands on him so his sight, his sight could be restored. In order for Saul to have his sight restored, he had to be in the right position. In order for Ananias to be used to accomplish God's will, he too had to be in the right position. Saul had to be at the house on Straight Avenue. Ananias had to go to the house on Straight Avenue. Both men could have been disobedient and out of position if either of them opted to do so. And if they did, they would have been a hindrance to what God wanted to accomplish. Is your unwillingness to accept your position hindering the fulfillment of God's purpose? not only in your life, but in the lives of others. Or unlike Ananias who questioned but obeyed, you question but you disobey when God says it's time to change your position. When God says, go to the straight street, you find excuses and so you become a hindrance to fulfillment of God's purpose in someone else's life while missing the privilege of being used by God. Your position is not accidental. Your position is not coincidental. Your position is not incidental. Your position is intentional because it is directly linked to God's purpose being fulfilled, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. And let's make no mistake. If God intends to use us for a purpose, he will use us. Let's make no mistake about that. But the time to the fulfillment of that purpose is determined by our proximity, your proximity to the destination. And remember, I referenced the Google Maps. Just picture on Google Maps, when you pick your location and you put in your destination, there's a little pin that appears where you are. And that pin that appears is determined by your geographic proximity to your intended destination. So if you follow the instructions on Google Maps, and if you follow the arrow, the pin will move closer to the destination as you travel. And the closer you get to your destination is the shorter the time to the destination gets. When you detour and decide that you're going to go a different way, the GPS doesn't change direction. God is not going to change, sorry, the destination. God is not going to change the destination. But what happens is that your proximity to the destination has changed. And so the length of time to the destination will change because your GPS now has to reroute you. How many of us as Christians have decided we do not like where we're positioned? We profess that we're sold out for Christ. We claim to embrace the mandate to win souls for Christ. 
But the truth is we want to dictate the terms. Lord, I thank you for this job you provided, but I can't stand the people or the hours are too long or the pay is too small. In other words, I don't like where I'm positioned now, so move me. Lord, I thank you for paying the bills last month. I thank you that I have food on the table, but I can't live day to day like this. So change my position from one of lack to plenty. Lord, my circumstances have remained the same for too long. Don't you see that I'm suffering? Those are the questions that we ask. And guess what? Oftentimes what we consider suffering is not even suffering for the sake of the gospel. Many of us are suffering in the pursuit of our own ambitions and in a bid to achieve temporal pleasures and comforts. Fulfillment of the godly call to purpose to win souls. Fulfillment of the royal mandate is not incidental. For many of us as Christians, it's something that falls secondary to our own dreams and ambitions. And that's a problem. How many of us who are listening can unequivocally say that the sufferings that you're experiencing are for the sake of the gospel? And for those who are, how often do you forget that suffering for the sake of the gospel is part of the Christian walk and not something to be avoided? So you may be suffering for the sake of the gospel, but how often do you forget that that suffering is part of the journey and not something that you should avoid? Recall what God said to Ananias in verse 15 to 16 when he was arguing about Saul. God said, don't argue, go. I have picked him as my personal representative to non-Jews and kings and Jews. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with this job. The NIV version says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And we see throughout the New Testament that Paul, Saul, suffered greatly for the sake of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, he writes, I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more sever severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open seas. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? What Paul experienced in his ministry was for the fulfillment of his divine purpose. His position in prison did not interrupt his fulfillment of God's purpose. In fact, his position in prison facilitated his purpose. Are you allowing your position to facilitate the fulfillment of your divine purpose? Paul could from prison write the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Positioned in the height of suffering, he wrote some of the most powerful letters to his fellow believers, encouraging them in the faith. Do you see your position as facilitating your purpose or do you see it as an interruption? And where does the rubber meet the road? Some of us are experiencing discomfort 
because of a shift in our circumstances as God shapes and fashions us into who he has called us to be. It may be financial. Your financial position may be as a result of a decision you have made to walk away from fixed income in obedience to what God has called you to do. Some may be experiencing loneliness because God told you to walk away from a friendship or a relationship. Some may be experiencing difficulties on the job because of co-workers who are rude, difficult, unkind. You know what your position is, but what is your posture in it? What if God has positioned you in that job? Because like Paul and Silas in prison, there's a jailer and his family who need to be saved. And it is going to take your being jailed and witnessing your miracle and your freedom for that person to believe in God for whose cause you are suffering. Maybe you're positioned on your job for that reason. Have you ever stopped to think that God placed you where you are because your position puts you within proximity of your purpose to be accomplished? Somebody in your proximity needs you to pray for them. Somebody within your proximity is waiting on you to listen and to encourage them. Somebody, somebody within your proximity is waiting on you to take your eyes off you and be open to hear God, what God is saying. You should do where you are. Somebody within your proximity is going to either come to know Christ or walk further away from him because of how you behave where you are positioned. Somebody within your proximity is listening to what you say about your mother, about your child, about your friend, about your sister, about your brother, about your pastor, about your boss, about your colleague. Is your witness a godly witness that will contribute to the fulfillment of God's purpose? And guess what? Financial position is a major one for many of us. What of your financial position? What if God has allowed you to be in that position of financial lack so that you can develop the faith to depend on him and on him only? And in so doing, it builds your faith muscles to endure and also minister to others who are in your shoes. What if God is allowing you to be in that place of lack to strip you of pride because you cannot Co pride and, and purpose cannot coexist. What if instead of praying away our lack, we ask God to reveal to us what he wishes to teach us in it so we do not have to repeat this journey? What if God has positioned you in a place of lack to test your faith? Will you give from that place of little, trusting that he will supply your needs? What is or little is much. Sorry, what is or little may be much for somebody else. And where we are positioned now, we can, though we consider it little, extend a hand to somebody else in their time of need. Will you give or will you hoard little because you do not trust God enough? What if your position in the midst of what you consider to be a war zone is intended to teach you about spiritual warfare so you can contend not only for yourself, but for others who will go through what you are going through. What if your current position is to take you to that place where like Paul, you can say as is written in Romans 8, 38 to 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can say without fear of contradiction that oftentimes the purpose God has called us to can only be attained by being positioned in a way that and in places 
we would prefer to avoid. Fred Hammond puts it like this, the rubber band cannot be launched unless it is stretched. Some of us have not been launched because we resent the stretching. Stretching brings tension. Tension from people disappointing you. Tension from friends being disloyal. Tension from the job that you do not want. Tension from the job that you want but do not get. Tension from the breakthroughs we expect but are being delayed. Have you considered the position of stretching God has you in is in preparation to launch you into the purpose he has for you? We refuse to accept that the stretching is part of God's providence and that providence is connected to our purpose. Joseph's position in the pit was part of God's providence because he had to be sold into slavery for his purpose to be fulfilled. What is your position of providence? Are you asking God to exchange your position of providence for a position of preference? The position of preference results in comfort. But guess what? God is less interested in our comfort than he is in the fulfillment of purpose. Do not forfeit your purpose for your preference. Preference says, I want to leave this job because I'm not comfortable. But purpose says, I will stay in my position because someone is watching my attitude and my language in the height of the abuse I'm suffering. And I will be a witness to someone who does not go know God. Preference says, I want my financial breakthrough now because I cannot live hand to mouth anymore. But purpose says, like Paul to the Philippians, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Why? Because there's someone who knows your circumstances that will marvel at how you can be at such peace in the midst of all that Paul just talked about and you still are so content. That person may see that in you, see that attitude, see that posture, see the smile when they know fully well what you're going through. And that person will want to come and know what it is that is in you that causes you to be at that place. That's purpose being fulfilled because that, that will lead to a soul being saved. Preference says, when NLH moves into its home church, you want to be seen and you want to be upfront and some things are beneath you. But purpose says, if you go into the bathroom and it needs to be mopped out, mop it out, or if the toilet needs to be cleaned, clean it. Because someone may come to NLH for the first time who is a germaphobe, and a dirty toilet may cause them never to return. We do not know what our position is there to accomplish. Preference and purpose cannot coexist. Preference shifts your focus from your God-ordained position and detours you on the journey to purpose. And sometimes, guess what? Purpose means separation. What if Abraham chose preference over purpose? and sought reconciliation of his relationship with Lot. Providence said, let Lot pick the best land and go his way. Because Abraham understood his position at a place of separation, what happened? Genesis 13, 14 puts it like this. The Lord said to Abraham after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, and to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. D do you catch what was said there? The promise of all the land Abra Abraham's eyes could see was not made by God until Lot left. It says, after Lot had parted from him. Who needs to leave you so you can be positioned to step into your purpose? But you are allowing preference to trump 
providence. The stretching and discomfort is dictating your decisions. But your position of stretching in the storms and trials God allows is intended to bring you to your purpose. I want you to catch that. Guess what? Let me give you another scenario. You're stretching and you're just comfort maybe like one I experienced sometime earlier this year I was having a conversation with a friend and the person did something that I thought was selfish and unkind and I highlighted it in the moment and the person responded and we both went about our business but when I got home I was so troubled by it I kept replaying it over and over and over in my mind and I went to bed regular time probably 11 whatever and for probably five hours, I could not sleep because I kept replaying this thing over and over in my mind. And I was tormented. That's how I would describe it. I processed the conversation and I started to think what I should have said. I started to recall other things that the person did however long ago. And when the person was selfish and all the selfish component and selfish and all of that. And I even began to rehearse in my mind what I was going to say to the person the next day. And I went further, just so I wouldn't forget to say anything that, I, that came to my mind. I, I, I recorded a voicemail, a voice note on my phone. As the things came to my mind, I recorded, said, make sure you say that, I'm not going to forget that. And so I had a list of things that I intended to say the next day and eventually went to my bed. Well, fell asleep, I was already in bed, but fell asleep. And I woke up tired and disheveled. And what compounded all of this, believe it or not, was that I was scheduled to minister right here at NLH, the Sunday following this incident. And so guess what? I now sought to justify my decision to deal with this issue because I want my heart to be clean because I'm preparing to speak. And so I thought it through again and planned what I was going to say to the person. And we saw each other the next day. And as I saw the person, a measure of love overwhelmed me and I couldn't understand it at the time, but later I understood it. As we spoke that day, I felt less and less compelled to raise the subject that I had so rehearsed in my mind. And what I began to realize was that the Lord was erasing the hurt and the anger and the frustration I was feeling and replacing it with love, grace, compassion, and mercy. What my flesh preferred was a confrontation, but what purpose demanded was conciliation. And this consolation never even needed to involve the person. This was between me and God. And as I prepared this message, the Lord reminded me of this experience I had earlier. And you know what I realized happened at the time? Didn't realize it at the time it happened, but in preparing this message, when it came back to mind, I realized. Preference wanted to say, you did me wrong. Preference wanted to say you hurt me and you need to know that you hurt me. Preference wanted to put that person in their place so that they know that I'm not a pushover. But I had to choose what I was going to do in the position that I was in. I was positioned to fulfill God's purpose of showing grace, compassion, mercy, and love to someone who needed it. Could that be you today? If yes, you may be the only Bible somebody will ever read. You may be the only sermon they will ever listen to. You may be the only Jesus they will ever encounter. So what will you choose? Preference, which leads to comfort and gratification of the flesh, or providence, which leads to the fulfillment of divine purpose. Let us choose to be driven by purpose so that it can be said of us like Paul did of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 4. He wrote, 
to the church of the Thess Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear that. It says your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. Paul would not have mentioned endurance unless there was something to endure. We all have something to endure. And it continues in verses five to eight. You know how we lived among you for your benefit and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achai. For the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achai, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Hear that. The people became imitators of Paul and the Lord in spite of severe persecution. What a beautiful thing that could be said of us. Reverend Heron references scripture last week, and it all ties in to the mandate of discipleship. If it could be said of us that persons became imitators of, of us and the Lord, and the word of the Lord ran out from all of them all over the world. That, my brothers and sisters, should be the ultimate end result. When you're positioned for purpose, that will always be connected to the salvation of souls. Pos being positioned for purpose will always be connected to the salvation of souls. And there may be some who are listening who you can't relate to the examples that I've shared. You may not be suffering the way others are suffering. You may not be living a life of lack or have to endure challenging work situations or difficult relationships. Maybe Life is comfortable for you and you're thanking God for a life of comfort and a life of abundance. But you too are positioned for purpose. What are you doing in the position of comfort and abundance that you're in? God blesses you so that you can be a blessing. Do not get blinded by the abundance and forget the purpose. And Tony Evans put it, puts it like this and I quote, it is unfortunate that many people, including Christians, would have spent a long time climbing the ladder of success, only to discover at the end that it was leaning against the wrong wall. In an effort to meet the standards of the world at what is called success, many would have missed the purposes of God. Perhaps they would have been very great in their careers, in their education, and their resources, but will stand before God, never having finished the work that he called them to do. Unfortunately, today it is easy to get caught up in the wrong purpose. The purpose of people, the purpose of possessions, popularity, paychecks, and power. End quote. My challenge to all of us today is to ensure that wherever we are positioned, we're advancing the purpose of the kingdom of God. And as I close, I want us to focus on something that many of us as Christians often talk about and even pray about, and that is power. Not carnal power, but the power that comes from having the person of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. I've often prayed, I, I have often prayed for God's power to be manifest through me. And some of you may have too, and you may still be praying for that. And nothing is wrong with wanting to see the manifest power of the Holy Spirit at work through us. And I believe it is something that we should desire, every believer should desire. But to what end? Sergio Chavez asks these questions that I want to pose to us today. You want power for what? 
You want to cast out demons for what? You want the gift of healing for what? You want to prophesy for what? You want to see deep into the spirit for what? Those are the questions that end there. You are saved, sanctified, as we love to say, Holy Ghost filled and walked, water baptized. And I ask for what? The reason why God gave power to the people was connected to salvation. And in Acts 2, it's evident that it was after the apostles were filled with power. We see that in Acts 2, 1 to 4, that salvation came to the masses. 3,000 were saved on that same day. In Acts 4, 4, we see where 5,000 were added to the numbers after Peter and John were jailed for preaching the gospel. Acts 5, we see miracles being performed more and more, and more persons were added to the numbers of those who were saved. In other words, what I'm saying is God does not release power for us to simply say that we have power. Ultimately, purpose is connected to salvation. The power that we desire to have in the fulfillment of our purpose is also connected to salvation. And in order for us to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, we desire God, sorry, in order for us to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, we desire God has to take us through some stuff to refine and prepare us for where he has positioned us. Let me read that again. In order for us to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit we desire, God has to take us through some stuff to refine us and prepare us for where he has positioned us. So let us not fight our position. Let us not question our position. Let us not run from our position. Let us not change our position when that is where God intends for us to be because we're positioned for purpose. And ultimately that purpose is for the salvation of souls. God bless you, amen.